Well, Gonzaga absolutely walloped Eastern Oregon on Wednesday, winning by a school record 78 points, while the result is not entirely surprising. We did learn a lot about Gonzaga's bench players, and that could be a big factor for this team as they get into conference play. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. All right, we are talking a little bit about this Eastern Oregon game. We're not going to dwell too much on the game just because an exhibition game is not necessarily going to tell us too much about the team but boy was it fun on Wednesday afternoon at the McCarthy Athletic Center 78 point victory the largest in school history again Eastern Oregon NAIA program not even at the division three level so you would expect it to be a big blowout. This team beat the beat Eastern Oregon 115 to 62 last year. So saw a similar thing, but still fun to kind of look at some of the records here. 73rd consecutive home victory. Every single starter for Gonzaga figure, finished in double figures. Uh, also a pair of reserves, Malachi Smith and Efton Reed, also in double figures. Seven Zags scoring 10 plus points. The team shot 70.8% from the field that is also a school record as well so absolutely dominant performance from the zags and they really got exactly what they wanted to get out of this game which was a nice little tune-up for all of the starters all of the key reserves and some opportunities for guys who don't get to play all that often to play so typically we split up post-game recaps into two segments we're going to kind of put it all into one today so we can focus on previewing Pepperdine in the second and third segments today Uh, so we're going to go through my five key things to watch coming into this game and how they played out here Uh, number one the the big key was no starters over 25 minutes I was hoping that Mark Few wouldn't run the starters too ragged right before they start conference play. He was listening, perhaps, or at least he had the same idea in his head. Uh, No starters played even more than 20 minutes. Julian Strother, Rasir Bolton, Anton Watson all played exactly 20 minutes in this one. Drew Timmy played 17. Nolan Hickman played 18. I think that is a perfect amount of playing time for those guys. Timmy, of course, doesn't need to be out there to risk any level of injury. He doesn't need the tune-up necessarily. Get him out there, get him some opportunities, get him to move up into fifth all-time on Gonzaga's scoring list. He passed Kevin Pangos, didn't stay in the game a whole lot longer than that. Uh, Cool opportunity for him. Elias Harris is next on Gonzaga's list. Nolan Hickman has been run a, a significant amount this year, played 40 minutes or close to 40 minutes in a handful of games for the Zags. So it was nice to, to get him an opportunity to sit a little bit longer in this one. The team leader in minutes uh, in this one was Malachi Smith. So not only did no starter play over 25 minutes, no player period played more than 25 minutes. Malachi played 25 and that was the most of any player. The next key in this one was seeing some minutes between Efton Reed and Ben Gregg playing together. That, to me, is the potential future of Gonzaga's front court. Uh, Depending on what Drew Timmy does next year, I'm expecting him to leave, although he does not have to leave. Uh, Same situation with Anton Watson. Uh, Ben Gregg, Efton Reed, likely going to be a bigger part of the puzzle next season, depending on what transfers could come in as well. And we got to see him play together in this game. And guess what? It was really fun. It was really fun. There was one play in particular. Ben Gregg made a really nice bounce pass as an entry to Efton Reed, caught the ball, spun quickly to the baseline, threw it down with two hands. Really, really nice play by those two guys. Both had really great performances. Efton Reed outscored Eastern Oregon in the second half. Individually, he did not score in the first half. He had 16 points on eight of eight shooting in the second half. Can't do a whole lot better than that. Eastern Oregon had 14 total points in the second half. A really nice performance from Reed. Only had two rebounds, didn't do a ton defensively. Uh, At that point, the game was well, well in hand. He was getting opportunities to score by just forcing himself into great position in the paint, uh, getting mostly dunks or really, really easy baskets around the rim. I'm not trying to discredit Reed's performance. It was excellent. It was fantastic to see him look confident, uh, have some swagger on the court, and be a focal point in the offense 
the the opponent obviously matters here, but still nice to see that. Ben Gregg, of course, uh, had another solid performance, 5.6 boards, three assists, and a block for Gregg. We have seen him kind of step out and play well against all calibers of opponents this year, but it was still nice to see that back or that front court combination with Gregg and Reed kind of look really solid in this game. Next up, one of the biggest talking points throughout the game uh, and a key that I had coming into the game was let's see what Dominic Harris can do. Let's get him some more minutes, get him out on the basketball court. Uh, and, and we did. And you know what? It was fantastic. But Dominic Harris looked really, really good in this game. He came in in the under 16 minutes in the second half. He basically played the rest of the game, I think, or close to it. He's he's. Given credit for 14 minutes on ESPN, uh, he made a nice pass to Reed on his very first possession in the game, finished with five points and a team-high five assists. He also had three rebounds, a steal, and a block. Really nice all-around performance from Dom. I want to point out that, of course, every single Gonzaga guard had a really nice game here. Nolan Hickman played well, Rasir Bolden played well, Malachi Smith, etc. So I don't think that this game indicates that Dom should be playing a ton more necessarily, but what it does indicate is that he is ready to contribute to this team. And when his number is called, when he has opportunities to go in the game, he is going to be ready. He is going to be there. Mark Few has continued to say that playing on this team is a privilege, not a right. Dom earned that right. He got into this game. He looked really good. We will see what more minutes come for him in the future. Uh, of course, it's a really crowded guard room this year. We haven't seen as much of that small ball lineup with Strother playing the four. If we see more of that, I think there's more opportunities for Dom to play. Uh, he has done what he needs to do in order to get more minutes. We will see how that shakes out during the season. Uh, again, a performance like this against an NAIA school should be taken with a little bit of a grain of salt for both Dom and for Efton Reed, quite honestly. Uh, but you, you can't have asked him to do a whole lot more than he did in this game. And, and it was it was really good to see him play well. Next up, I wanted to see more offense from, from Hunter Salas. Uh, in games like this, I think there's more of an opportunity for him to kind of play more of a playmaker role, a creator role, instead of just being kind of a secondary offensive player. Uh, we saw him be kind of the point guard de facto for a while in this game. He finished with four assists, which was very, very nice to see from him. Uh, seven points on three of six shooting. Uh, he did knock down his only three-point shot, had a really nice dunk in transition on a pass from Nolan Hickman. Probably would have seen a little bit more from him in this one, but he did foul out in 20 minutes. I'm not really concerned about that, especially in a game like this but it did hurt him in the sense that he was out for the last few minutes, which may have been some opportunities for him to create some, some shots for himself. Still a nice performance from him. Good to see him be a little bit more creative on offense and really good to see him be more of a distributor. If he can be a guy who can get three, four, five assists per game, that changes Gonzaga's dynamic quite significantly. And then finally, the main question, will those non-rotation guys make an appearance? We did not see Braden Huff or Caden Perry. The expectation is that both of those guys are redshirting. Uh, we don't know the injury status on Perry right now, but not really surprising to not see them. We didn't see Joe Few, but we did see the other two walk-ons, Colby Brooks, Another appearance this season. Guys, he has looked good every time he has come into the game. He reminds me again a lot uh, of Connor Griffin, who was at Gonzaga a few years ago, ended up going to University of Washington, playing tight end over there. Uh, Brooks is a really talented player, similar to Griffin. Every time they came in, you were like, oh, wow, that guy can really play. Uh, he had seven points and three rebounds in four minutes. He played four minutes of basketball, finished with seven points on three or four shooting. He knocked down a three. He had a steal. He had a nice putback, really nice performance from Brooks. Abe Eagle made his Gonzaga debut. He has been on the roster for the last two years for the first time. He got to enter a game in the kennel. Really cool experience for him. They almost immediately got him the basketball on the low block. He turned little baby hook, boom, first points in a Gonzaga uniform, first collegiate points ever for the six foot nine walk on forward for the Zags. He also had an assist. Really cool to see him get that opportunity in a game like this. Well, again, there's no, no need to really dwell too long on an exhibition game, so we're going to turn our attention to Gonzaga's first WCC opponent of the year and discuss why this game against Pepperdine could present much more of a challenge than people might expect. But before we get there, a word from Bet Online. College basketball and the NBA are back in action. College football bowl season and the NFL playoffs are right in the thick of their seasons. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all of the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. 
They even have lines for coaching changes across every major sport. So even in the off season, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked On Zags. And I want to sincerely thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked On can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. Well, the Zags open up conference play on New Year's Eve December 31st, 2 p.m., McCarthy Athletic Center. They are taking on Lorenzo Romar and the Pepperdine Waves. Gonzaga currently boasts a 43-game winning streak against Pepperdine. Pepperdine, excuse me, that is going to be up to challenge on the 31st. Can they get to 44 consecutive wins over the Waves? Their 73 consecutive wins at home is also on the line against Pepperdine. If they can win them both, they have 44 straight against Pepperdine, 74 straight at home continuing to move those school and NCAA records forward. Uh, So let's meet the Waves. Let's talk about this Pepperdine team. We discussed them a bit on WCC Power Rankings for Wednesday's episode, but I want to talk a little bit more about who this team is. They are currently 7-7 seven and seven on the season. Uh, they started out a little bit better than that. They were 5-2 and two at one point. They have gone 2-5 and five in their last seven games, unfortunately. Don't really have any major wins. Their best victory is against a solid Big West squad in UC Irvine, but that's their best victory at this point in the year. Uh, they blew out Rice to begin the season and have kind of been up and down ever since. Uh, They have a loss to Grand Canyon, a solid school in the WAC. They have a loss to Hawaii, who looked very good in the Diamond Head Classic, Diamond Head Classic, excuse me, which took place over Christmas in Hawaii. So that was probably an advantage there uh, for Hawaii. Uh, They also have a win, or excuse me, a loss to Iona. Rick Pitino's Gales uh, beat them by 10 in their most recent game. Currently, Ken Palm has Pepperdine just inside the top 150. They are 142nd in Ken Palm. Offensively, they rank 166th. Defensively, they rank 130th. So kind of pretty even offensively and defensively, even as in a a pretty average team across all of the Division I landscape. Uh, And then the interesting thing, tempo, they are 22nd. For reference, Gonzaga, 45th. Pepperdine plays at a higher, faster tempo than Gonzaga does this year. Part of that has been Gonzaga has struggled to get out in transition as much as they have as previous years. Of course, part of it is that Gonzaga is playing very long and athletic teams for the most part, so they have struggled to get out in transition because of the opponent caliber that they have played. Regardless, that is something to watch for in this game, is that Pepperdine is going to be trying to get out in transition routinely throughout the contest, and Gonzaga is going to have to be careful about getting back in transition and preventing them from getting easy buckets. Uh, Looking at the players on Pepperdine's team, I've talked about this guy a handful of times, but I still don't think he's getting talked about enough on a national landscape. That is Maxwell Lewis. Maxwell Lewis will be a 2023 first-round pick. I feel extremely confident about that. Last year when I was had Asher Lowe on the podcast, who is a giant Pepperdine fan, the PA announcer for the Waves, uh, him and I discussed Jalen Williams, who was at the time at Santa Clara, and he staked his claim that he was going to be a first-round pick. This was in about January. Jalen Williams, of course, ended up going 12th overall to the Oklahoma City Thunder, and now looks like he should have probably been a top five or at least a top 10 pick in that draft. I see a similar trajectory for Maxwell Lewis. They aren't exactly the same player, but Lewis has been absolutely dominant for the Waves this season. He's a six foot seven wing. He can do it all. He can create his own shot. He can shoot from the outside. He's a good defensive player, long athletic guy, currently averaging 19 and a half points per game, six rebounds, 2.7 assists, also averaging just over a steal and a block per game. He is shooting 53% from the field, 43% from deep, and 85% from the free throw line. There is not a good way to stop this guy on the offensive end of the floor. He can kill you from the free throw line. He can kill you from deep. He can kill you around the rim. He's a good rebounder. He's a good passer. He's just a really, really talented player, and he's a tough matchup for Gonzaga. We'll talk a little bit more in the third segment about how I think Gonzaga should attack him and how they should try to stop him in this game, but ultimately – 
there are a lot of teams who have tried a lot of different things to stop Maxwell Lewis this year, and they have struggled to do so. Gonzaga is, of course, going to be the best opponent Pepperdine has played this year. So that is something to keep an eye on uh, in this one. And, and UCLA is one of Gonzaga or one of Pepperdine's other good games, and UCLA did not struggle to beat Pepperdine in this one. So I don't think it's necessarily a deal breaker for Gonzaga, but he is a player to keep a close eye on in this one. And Houston Millette. Houston Millette is a, another sophomore on this team. He averaged 23 points a game in two games against Gonzaga. Zaga last year. He's still fantastic. He's averaging 13 and a half points, four boards, 3.2 assists. He's also shooting about 40% from deep. Mike Mitchell Jr., the third in this tremendous sophomore class for Lorenzo Romar, Lewis, Millette, Mitchell, all sophomores. Mitchell's averaging 11 points, four and a half assists, four boards. He's shooting, I mean, this is not a typo, 47% from deep there. So three guys all shooting 40 ish percent from deep all scoring over 10 points per game, all grabbing rebounds, all getting assists, a really nice trio of players for the Pepperdine Waves. The team collectively is shooting 38% from deep. Good, balanced, solid offensive squad. Javon Porter is a freshman. He is the younger brother of Michael Porter Jr., who is in the NBA with the Denver Nuggets. Javon Porter is averaging 10.5 points and 7.5 rebounds per game as one of Pepperdine's bigger players. He's also shooting 34% from deep, so they can just stretch it out. Everybody can knock down threes. It's going to be critical for Gonzaga to attempt to stop that. Now, Pepperdine does turn the ball over about 15 times per game. They are shooting under 70% from the free throw line. They don't have a ton of size in the front court, certainly not a ton of depth in the front court size-wise. So again, we're still talking about a WCC team that is expected to finish outside of the top five in the WCC. Gonzaga doesn't lose to those teams very often. Gonzaga hasn't lost to Pepperdine in many, many years. So despite the fact that I am high on this team, I am optimistic about the future of this team. I believe they have at least one, potentially multiple NBA players on the roster. I don't think they have the overall depth and overall talent to to really beat Gonzaga, but boy, could they keep this thing close. Could they make it a little nerve wracking for Gonzaga fans on the final day of the year 2022? Could they give us a little bit of a scare? Absolutely. I think this team could do it, uh, but I think Gonzaga is ultimately going to take it. And what I really want to talk about in the third and final segment is, is how to do that, what Gonzaga needs to do. Often my five keys are just things I'll be watching for. Here we're going to focus a little bit more on what Gonzaga actually needs to do to win the dang basketball game, because this is not a game that you can coast through entirely. This is not a game where you can't play a single starter less than 20 minutes like they did against Eastern Oregon. There's a whole subset of college basketball fans who think Gonzaga plays teams like Eastern Oregon every day, and they do not. That is not the team that they're playing here. They got some things they're going to have to work on, things they're going to have to prove in order to secure a victory here against Pepperdine. Uh, before we get into all that, though, a word from the NHTSA. You're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. It is the holidays after all. It's New Year's. A few drinks becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end and people start to head out, you think of calling for a ride. Now, you can get home, okay? It's not a big deal. What are the odds you're going to get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. All right, segment three. Still any patents, still... Locked on Zag, still previewing Gonzaga's WCC opener, the final game of the year 2022, taking place on New Year's Eve, 2 p.m. McCarthy Athletic Center against Lorenzo Romar and the Pepperdine Waves. We're going to take a, my, take a look at my five keys to a victory for Gonzaga in this one, the ability to extend their win streak over Pepperdine to 44 and their home win streak to 74. First key in this one is simple, defend the perimeter. Defend the perimeter. Gonzaga has been a bit spotty at defending the perimeter so far this year. We've seen teams like Texas absolutely cook them from beyond the arc. We've seen a few other teams really succeed at shooting from deep, of course. Uh, Pepperdine is a much better three-point shooting team than some of those teams. Texas came into that game as shooting sub-20% from deep before they went off and dropped 13 made threes uh, on the Zags. That was a bit of an anomaly. Gonzaga likely game-planned as if Texas wasn't going to shoot that well, uh, and it kind of bit him in the butt in that one here. No reason 
No reason to not be aggressively stopping guys from getting open looks from beyond the arc. Tepperdine as a team shoots 38% from deep. That is phenomenal. That is a phenomenal number. All three of Pepperdine's best players, the sophomore trio of Mike Mitchell, Maxwell Lewis, Houston Millette, all of them are good three-point shooters. Every single one of them is very good from beyond the arc. Again, Javon Porter can shoot it from there. They have a handful of other players off the bench who can shoot it really well from deep. So, I think this is going to be a really big game from Hunter Salas. Hunter Salas needs to be a guy who plays 25, 30 minutes in this one. I don't care what he does offensively. I've talked about wanting to see him get a little bit more creative offensively. We talked about that in the first segment. Uh, It's not that I don't want him to do that still, but really his impact in this game is going to be on the defensive end. He needs to hound Houston Millette, hound Mike Mitchell. Do not let those guys get open looks. Be right in their face throughout the game knock the ball away, get some steals, get out in transition, do all of that stuff. Nolan Hickman, Rasir Bolton, they're going to have big games as well because they're going to play 25, 30, 35 minutes in this one, and they're going to be asked to guard some of the best best guards in the entire WCC. How they do on the defensive end of the floor is going to say a lot about Gonzaga's ability to pull away and secure a victory in this one. Next up, it's really a key for every game, but I wanted to highlight it specifically in this one. Get the ball to Drew Timmy. Get the ball to Drew Timmy a lot. Get the ball to Drew Timmy early and often. This is almost always a key, like I said, but there's just not a reason to dance around it. Pepperdine doesn't have the size and the talent in the front court to hang with Drew Timmy. Most teams don't. Most teams don't. There have been very few teams Gonzaga has played that do. Purdue is one. Kentucky is one. Yeah, that's 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 almost it uh, in terms of that. Baylor Flo Thamba is a very good defensive player, not a great offensive player, but he did a good job on Drew. This is not a team that's going to be able to do that. Bubakar Kulabale uh, is a transfer from USC. He's been solid for them so far. They also have center Carson Basham. He's been good this year, but neither of those guys are good enough to really stymie Drew Timmy. Uh, and and so the 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 game plan should just be get the ball down the court, get the ball to Drew, let him go to work. This is a game where he could score twenty five points and rest the last eight minutes. Like that's the kind of contest that I expect from Drew Timmy in this one. That is the way you beat this team. Just go to Drew, let him go to work, give him the ball early, give him the ball often, give him the ball 16, 18 feet away from the basket. If you have to swing the ball around for 24 seconds and then give him the ball with five on the shot clock, whatever you need to do. I think that's the best way to beat this team. Pepperdine is a good, but not great defensive team. They're more likely to be able to stop Gonzaga's guards than they are their front court. So just don't give them that opportunity. Get the ball to Drew, let him go to work. Simple as that. Next up, a key that's been a key for a handful of different games this year, but I think makes a lot of sense in this contest. Get out in transition. Pepperdine likes to run. Like I said, their tempo is 22nd in the country. Gonzaga's is 45th. Pepperdine could outrun Gonzaga. I don't think that their goal is going to be to try to get into a foot race with the Zags because I don't think that's a particularly good strategy. Then again, I have not been particularly high on Lorenzo Romar as a coach, so maybe they will attempt to do that. If so... If Gonzaga gets feels like they're being challenged to attract me, take the challenge. <laughs> let it go. Let's let's see what Rasir Bolton can do out in transition. Let's see what Malachi Smith can do in transition. Again, Pepperdine turns the ball over about 15 times per game. That's against teams that are not as good as Gonzaga for the most part. Gonzaga could pretty easily force 10 to 12 turnovers on their own in this game. Pepperdine turns the ball over a few other times. That gives Gonzaga plenty of opportunities to get out in transition. Score some easy buckets that way uh, and really kind of separate themselves in the scorebook in this one. I think Rasir Bolton should get some points out in transition. Smith should get some points out in transition. It's a good way to build a lead. It's a good way to maintain a lead. Uh, It's something we haven't seen from Gonzaga a ton this year. It'd be great to go on to Ken Palm after this game and see Gonzaga move four, five, seven spots up in the tempo markings at Ken Palm because of how much they got out in transition in this one. Next up, our fourth key to victory for the Zags in this one, an A game from Anton Watson. I think he's a huge key in this game because I think he's a really tough matchup for the Waves. Six foot eight forward, can play away from the rim, can play with his back to the basket. I'm not really sure who is going to guard him. Again, the two bigs for Pepperdine, Kalabale and Carson, Carson Basham, they're more traditional centers. I think they're more likely to line up against Drew. But if they're in the game at the same time, one of them is guarding Anton Watson. Anton can pull them away from the rim in a way that I think creates a disadvantage for Pepperdine. Uh, I think he's going to be a guy who should have a good offensive game here, score in double figures, be efficient with the basketball, stretch the defense a little bit, uh, get some offensive rebounds, crash in the glass that way. And then I think the big thing for Anton is what he does on the defensive end of the floor. We mentioned Hunter Salas and helping to stop Gonzaga, or excuse me, stop Pepperdine's 
uh, perimeter scorers. But Maxwell Lewis is the best player on this team. He's one of the best players on the floor. He's the best NBA prospect on the floor, most likely, at least at this point. And for the Zags, the matchup is going to have to be Anton. Julian Strother could guard him, and I think there will be moments where he guards him, and I think he'll do a fine job of it. But Anton is the best lengthy perimeter defender they have. He's the best overall matchup for a guy like Maxwell Lewis. We saw him do a good job against Oscar Shebe, but we also saw Brandon Miller score like 36 points on Gonzaga in, in the Alabama game. It didn't end up mattering. Gonzaga still won that one because they scored 100 points. If Maxwell Lewis goes off like that, and I know some people might think that's silly, there are NBA draft scouts who are literally comparing Maxwell Lewis and Brandon Miller right now. Uh, Miller is ahead, but they are still being compared. So to, it's not that crazy to talk about those two guys in the same sentence. I don't think Lewis is about to drop 27 on the Zags in the second half. But again, that's where Anton Watson and his defensive strengths, his quick hands, his size, his frame, everything is going to come into play significantly in terms of what he can do on the defensive end of the floor to prevent Maxwell Lewis from going absolutely nuclear on the Zags in the kennel on New Year's Eve. And finally, another key in this game, I want to see more from Efton Reed. I want to see an opportunity for him to play legitimate minutes. Now, I mentioned how important Drew Timmy will be in this game, how likely it is that he might play 30, 32, 34 minutes in this one, depending on if Gonzaga can separate in the scoreboard. I also mentioned that Anton Watson should play a lot in this game and has a very significant role. I didn't talk a lot about Ben Gregg, but Ben has solidified himself as a player who plays 15 to 20 minutes every single game. If all of those those things happen. There's not a ton of playing time left for Efton Reed. However, I think you have to build on his confidence a little bit here. And this goes the same for, for Dominic Harris, a similar situation of I'm not sure where there's a ton of playing time here, but those two guys just had really nice performances. Yes, it was an exhibition game. Yes, it was an NAIA opponent, but that builds confidence. They showed out on the home crowd in front of the fans in a major way a few days ago. You should reward them with more playing time. I, you have to find it in the game plan. And unfortunately, unless Gonzaga is up 15 to 20 with five or so minutes to go, it might be hard for these guys to get playing time in this one. And that's a little frustrating. Hopefully, Mark Few can find time to get first half minutes for Efton Reed. P maybe even first, time minute, first half minutes for Dominic Harris, or at least early second half minutes for Dominic Harris. I want to see those guys rewarded because their confidence is building, because they had a good performance at home because they're parts of this program's future. These guys could be starters down the line for Gonzaga. They're not there right now. But when you show out, when you play well, and you feel like you earn more playing time, if you don't get it, if you feel like, well, what do I have to do? I did it for you. I did it on the on the court here, and you're not getting that playing time. It can build some resentment, some frustration. I don't know these guys personally. I don't want to comment on what I think that their perceived attitude is going to be, but it's just human nature to feel like, hey, I did well, and now I'm not playing again. What's the deal? And so I'm hoping that there's an opportunity for both these guys to get minutes, get opportunities to really show out against a team that is far better than Eastern Oregon, but a team that both these guys should be able to play good basketball against. All right, that's going to do it for me today and for this week. No episode on Friday. So this is actually the final episode of the year 2022. So thank you all for listening, for joining me here in this calendar year. We'll be back after the new year and we're coming back with Mailbag Monday as well. So get your questions in now. Wait till after the Pepperdine game if you want. Whatever questions you have, I will attempt to collect them all up as well as previous questions that have been asked over the last few weeks. So it might be a pretty crowded mailbag. So get your questions in. Looking forward to bringing that back as we get back into conference play. Also, don't forget to check out the new Locked On College Basketball podcast hosted by myself and my co-host Isaac Shade of Locked On Tar Heels. We are talking everything college basketball for the rest of the season five days a week get it wherever you get podcasts find it on youtube if you haven't done so yet go to youtube.com search locked on college basketball hit that big red subscribe button scroll down find yourself locked on zags hit subscribe there as well if you haven't done so yet finally I want to thank you all for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.